So I'm going to talk about virtual embodiment. And first, I'd like to just explain why. So you may have heard of spiritual but not religious. Uh, in Europa practice day, there was a panel discussion on that. There's been all sorts of, it's a very hot topic. And one of the reasons why, some evidence, is that in 2012, the Pew Research Center conducted a survey in America. And uh, from people that they surveyed, they found that about 20% of the American population is religiously unaffiliated, including 34% of people born between the years of 1990 and 1994, the newest generation of adults, the younger millennials, as they're called, are a third of them do not have any religious affiliation. They, this research survey also found, though, that still many of these people have some form of spiritual connection. 68% of these of the 68% of the 20% of America that is religiously unaffiliated still believes in God. Um, over half of these people have some kind of spiritual connection with the earth. And 37% of the religiously unaffiliated adults in America, which totals to 17 million people, identify as spiritual but not religious. Something that's just been arising. It's not like there's been a teacher saying you shall identify as spiritual but not religious. This has just been coming up in 17 million different people. So it's a very, um, it's very prevalent. And there are many reasons why, but I just want to take a moment to uh, sort of acknowledge that that exists and to really validate it. Part of the reason that I wanted to write my paper on this topic is because it's what I feel most connected to. Mm -hmm. and we, right here at Nairobi University, I think we're practicing a bit of this, we're exploring different religious and spiritual practices. Um, uh, one friend and teacher likes to make mention of how on Shambhala Day here at Nairobi University, at this Tibetan Buddhist inspired university located on Arapaho Avenue in Colorado, <laughs> um, a man named Howard Badham comes, who's a Native American, and reads the I Ching. <laughs> and that happens, and it's a, it's a really beautiful thing. And so this is. You know, we could just take a survey, I'm not going to do this, but how many religions are represented in this room right now? You know, we're, we're living in a time when through travel, just through on one city block, it's almost as if these different religions, it's as if Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad, they're all talking to each other through us. The, uh, the ancient communication is, it's, it's, it seems like it's the first time this has ever happened. Of course, there's been trade routes and cross-cultural exchanges and such. But right now, it's really, and it's pretty wild to think how all these different religions are actually blending together. And so, here, we're looking, we might be interested in finding some sort of practical way to deal with our worlds. And when we have all these different religions, you know, Jesus might say to Buddha, hey, you're doing that sitting thing. I was doing that in the desert. <laughs> And a lot of forgiveness. And Buddha would say, oh yeah, yeah, we've got compassion. And us today in this world, we can see, oh, well, there's all these different things that are unique to each religion and all very applicable and fruitful. You know, yoga asanas access different channels than Tai Chi does within the body. So there's, there's something going on. There's, it's worth exploring. And there is just a, uh, a caveat to make which is that this exploration can become something very disrespectful. Um, and this is, I think, why the New Age movement has a kind of a bad rap. Um, there's a bit of this sort of, it's not really a, a religion or anything. It's, it's kind of New Agey, hoity floity <laughs> thing going on. Um, and so what's happening when that happens is something known as cultural appropriation. I'd just like to take a moment to talk about what that is. And basically, it's stealing from another culture without paying respect. It's not acknowledging the origins of one practices the person finds and feels connected with. And so the ways that this can look is um, wearing a Native American headdress as a fashion accessory rather than recognizing the ritual 
realistic and very serious implications that different cultures have used headdresses for in the past. And what happens when somebody take, borrows and uses something from another tradition that they were not raised in, that they found on their own, is that it, without recognizing the origins, it really depreciates the value of, of those cultures. And it perpetuates an attitude that says, I'm going to practice what I like, something that's good for me, and it feels good, and I don't really care about what, where it came from and all the lessons that were learned when it first was born. I'm just going to do it because it feels good for me. And in a lot of religions and spiritual, and spiritual texts, there's usually an emphasis on selflessness and focusing just on oneself and not acknowledging originating cultures is actually a parasitic practice that isn't just, doesn't just have spiritual ramifications but it also affects different cultures politically, socially, economically, and environmentally as well. So I encourage everyone to recognize what you're connected with and just instead of saying I'm going to do what I want to do and I don't really care about you, just acknowledge that I'm going to practice my yoga asanas and I realize that I'm in Colorado and the climate here is very different than in India where these practices first developed. And that's cool, they're probably even going to look a little bit different than they live in America, but I respect what you're doing over there and keep going. Don't replace their truths with another culture's truths, because both are valid. So that's, I brought that in because that's something I see happening in a lot of spiritual circles today, is a very selfish practicing of other traditions without acknowledging the histories. So, if one can practice different traditions with a respect and some form of beneficial blending of different traditions. One thing that I found very helpful is having some kind of framework within which to ground these different practices. And I don't want to go too much into this, even though it's very interesting, I'm going to touch on some other topics, but um, having a frame of anything, whether it's a, uh, this thing, or if it's um, the ceiling of a church, or an abandoned city building, a frame can really intensify and enhance whatever is being portrayed. Having some kind of framework can also give it a structure, give it some a place for it to be to be supported, through which from which it can have a foundation to be built up on. Um, so I'll have some question and answer time after that. We can talk about that a bit more, but just suffice it to say that a frame can be very helpful for any kind of practice, something to ground you and contain what you're doing. And it just so happens that all of us here, as we saw in the opening exercise of standing up, that we all are born with a frame that is perfect for <laughs> spiritual practices. Um, and it's perfect for a few reasons. I'm talking about the body here. The physical body is the basis for all of existence. So, first fact, for us to be sitting here and thinking about all of this, and whether we agree with it or not, we couldn't do any of that if we didn't have a body and the, the instruments with which to experience all of this. The body is basic. And also, it's universal. Everyone has a body. They're not at all the same, but everyone does have a body. Everything that is a thing has some form of body of you know, getting to do ghost sacrifices and you have to sell the thing we're not gonna go there right now. Um, rather uh, it's just important to recognize that bodies are basic, they're universal, which is perfect for this day and age. Now so what is embodied spirituality? Um, I don't know. <laughs> It's, it's not, from, from what I've been finding and kind of figuring out as I go, is that it's not really a dogma, and it's not a doctrine, but it's more of a, an orientation, and it's more of a view, and even an attitude. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, a professor at CIIS, California Institute of, Institute of Integral Studies, in Jorge Ferrer, teaches in the East-West Psychology Department, 
He wrote a great article called What Does It Mean to Live a Fully Embodied Spiritual Life? And within this article, it's a short article, a few pages, he lists five views of an embodied spirituality. So I'd like to name these five views as sort of a basis for a way to approach what an embodied spirituality can look like and feel like. So the first view, um, and let me first just say that with using these views, one can practice yoga asanas or tai chi or Alexander technique or myriads, like countless things that haven't even been imagined yet. Different things that can incorporate these views and be practiced in the body and spiritual and mindful way. The first view is that the body is a subject. It's not an it, but a thou. Uh, so instead of just talking about it when it breaks, like it's not in the room, okay, the body is in the room. Right? Respect it and say, hey, how's it going? Don't just talk to the doctor about what can I what can you do to fix this thing? It's like what, what can we do together to work together? It's, it's a vast, it's a, an attitude of respect. The second view of an embodied spirituality that Pepper posits is to view the body as a spiritual substance. And we might think of spiritual substances, ghosts and angels being this ethereal source of things. So in this idea, the body, the physical body, is spiritual substance made manifest, made tangible. Feel your hand right now. Has anyone ever heard the phrase dead matter? Yeah, I mentioned this to my parents, and I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> but uh, it, is, it seems common to me that we talk about lifeless matter, that physicality is just atoms and these little things, and it's all objects, and it doesn't have any intelligence of its own, not really alive. This challenges that view, and says matter is alive, it does have intelligence, and it's highly intelligence, in fact. The third view of an embodied spirituality is that the body is a source of spiritual insight. So this can be applied in a, in a gross way, for instance, your body will tell you if it's hungry, or if it's not, no more. In a more subtle way, um, when you leave this room, you'll be faced with a choice. You can turn left, or you can turn right. Both ways will take you to the future. But if you feel into your body, it can actually tell you to go this way, or it can tell you to go, go this way. And even life decisions, what job to take, what school to go to, where to move. Your body can actually tell you, it can feel, whether you feel expanded when you think about that, or you feel contracted and kind of maybe, like in Chloe in your open meditation, feeling into the, the grain texture that was in the room at the moment. Similar to that, and that's a source of both wisdom and insight. The fourth view of an embodied spirituality is that the body is a microcosm of the universe and the mystery. And so, in there are different adages about this as above, so below, um, or that we are made in the image of God. To use that language, I like to think that we're not, we may not be identical to God, but we are self similar extensions of God. Or, in other words, say that we are fractals of the universe. Physically. So recognizing that we can see the body as playing a very important part, as a, a holographic part of everything that's happening in our planet and beyond. And the fifth view of the body in a spiritually embodied way, just to review, we've got the subject, we've got spiritual substance. We've got uh, a source of spiritual insight, a microcosm of everything, and the body is essential for an enduring spiritual transformation. So what this points to is that no matter how much we might think about compassion, no matter how much we might 
really believe in equanimity. When we're faced on Pearl Street with a homeless person asking for some money, going through immense suffering, how will your body react? When you have a disagreement with a loved one, you might talk about compassion, but what are you actually going to say? <laughs> when the body, the body, it reacts first. It will interpret threats. And it will become charged. And it will enter survival mode when different conflicts arise. So no matter how much we might believe in spiritual principles, Unless we can work with the body, we're just intellectually bypassing what's really going on at the ground level. So how to work with the body, we've got one of the most important things that I found at Naropa was going to the counseling center, seeing a psychosomatic therapist, and continually every time I would bring up an issue I was having, they would say, oh, where do you feel that in your body? Just continually noticing that what I'm going through is an embodied experience. And then, somehow, if you just notice in your own belly, or in your own body, what's going on, if you're bored, or if you're excited, or if you're scared, or confused, you might find, as I've found, that by feeling it as a physical energy, as a sensation within the body, it somehow becomes more workable, more manageable. Here at Naropa, we're based on, founded on by Trumpet Rinpoche, who also kind of the Shambhala tradition, and something that I've heard Dale Asriel or, or I think Pema Chodron, either one of them, I think they both say that the other one invented this technique. <laughs> it's called the laser technique, L-E-S-R. And it's a technique of locating emotions within the body. It's L. E is um, something else. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's embracing that in some form, saying, okay, this exists. Then S is stopping the story. Like, I'm valid and feeling this angry because they did this. Just stop that and just feel the sensation. And then R is remain with it, L-E-S-R, just remain with the sensation. So that's something that comes from very close related to Naropa, is that technique of working, that's actually a way of working with emotions right there in the body. So, in summary, um, spiritual but not religious, it's popular, <laughs> um, it's valid, it's practical, and it's what's going on for a lot of people. Now, to turn people away from religions, just to say that this is one way of working with the modern, globalized, intercommunicative, and traveling world. Cultural appropriation, it's harmful, it's selfish, don't do it. <laughs> um, it's just a matter of having respect, basically. And as I say in my paper, it's not about walking on eggshells afraid that we're going to harm, offend people. It's about recognizing that we're actually walking on graves of ancestors. And to have respect for our, those ancestors and for their living descendants. Um, framework, helpful. Body, basic, <laughs> universal. And subject, spiritual substance, wisdom, microcosm of my, the macrocosm, and necessary for any form of real spiritual evolution. Thank you. <laughs>